On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. My name is Don, and today my guest is Dr. Bill Miller. So we're going to talk a little bit about Dr. Miller's journey from being a physician to an evolutionary biologist. I've had a great conversation with him off the air today, and uh, I feel like this conversation about uh, his journey of, of sort of Moving to evolutionary biology is going to be very instrumental for a lot of individuals that listen to this show. In addition to that, he's written a couple of books, The Microcosm Within, and then he's also here to talk to us today about his new book, The Bioverse. So with that, Dr. Miller, welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on, Don. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to move you around on the screen for anybody that's, okay. uh, that's watching us here. I'll try and get you a little bit more, more I centered can. for everybody too. But, uh, but yeah, so, so would you mind telling the guest or telling the audience just a little bit about yourself? I was a physician, uh, happily in practice for over 35 years, academic and private practice. And I thought that I would just continue to do that. Uh, forever and never had any plans for any kind of a, of a second career of any sort. Uh, but I, I'm a living proof that there is such a thing as a second act. And it absolutely can come out of nowhere because my becoming an evolutionary biologist is, is almost as strange to me as if I had somehow ended up a chef, a sushi <laughs> chef and, and done uh, sushi for a living. It was, there was nothing in my previous set of interests that would have specifically ima- let me imagine or anyone else who knew me that I was going to go down this pathway. And I can tell you how it all happened. I I, I happened to ma- meet a boy named Sue. I don't know if you, any of your listeners know about the Johnny Cash song, the famous Johnny Cash song. Um, in my case, the boy named Sue is the magnificent Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil that sits in the rotunda of the Chicago Field Museum, the magnificent rotunda. And I happened to go there just by chance. I was at a medical meeting with a a brilliant partner of mine. We were sitting for days on end listening to lectures that were important, but eventually I just couldn't sit anymore. And we both decided to play hooky. We chose the Field Museum and I walked in there and I was uh, astounded. I, I just was I, I almost shaken is the best word shaken because I know a lot about human anatomy, uh, x-ray anatomy, human bones, where the muscles articulate, why they go to those spots, the shape of the ribs, the shape of the vertebrae, uh, the hip bone shape, the pelvic socket shape. I know all that stuff because that's what I needed to know for my job. And I was just, I just didn't, had never realized before how closely the bones of a T-Rex resemble ours. Yeah, of course, you've got to make allowances for scale. That's enormously yeah, different. Sure. But the point is the functional aspects of them, their actual living characteristics and how their mechanical advantages work to the benefit of this creature um, I, I, were, it was amazing to me. And I didn't know any of the fancy words of an evolution that I came to learn later about convergent evolution and so on. But there was one other observation that was crucial to me. And that was the arms of that T-Rex are just ridiculously small. They just are not useful arms. <laughs> I mean, the, the poor beast couldn't even pick its nose. Mm-hmm. And that additionally made no sense. So I turned to my my partner, who's very, very smart. And I'm just talking about these things. I'm saying, geez, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And he goes, well, you're nuts. It just <laughs> takes a lot of time. And as, as I was saying earlier to you, Don, that was as if a gauntlet had been thrown. Someone had given me a problem to think about. And for some reason, it began to dominate my thoughts. And I was blessed with the internet being active and libraries that I could go to. And I spent well over the next 10 years just studying up and devising new thoughts. Uh, One very important aspect of that new thought process 
was in the work I did, I had the advantage of seeing all of the work of the varying specialties. They all had to come to me for um, further advice. And so I learned a lot about patterns of disease that are not as familiar to each of the physicians that are in their special separately uh, specialties because you tend to silo. Mm. An orthopedist knows what an orthopedist knows and a neurologist knows what a neurologist will know. But I was in a, in a more general uh, circumstance in which I came across almost everything they came across. And what I noticed was there were certain recurring patterns of disease that related to infectious disease dynamics. And that led me to an odd thought that was percolating in the background, completely different from evolutionary biology. And that was, if these germs, these bugs are going preferentially to certain sites, so much so that you can predict for your clinician what that bug is. So let's take a certain pattern on a, a brain scan. Um, and if it's a certain pattern in a certain way, that's toxoplasmosis. And you can tell the clinician that's toxoplasmosis and you're going to be right 98% of the time. Um, and so the, the physician can actually start treatment before the, the titers come back, or at least can start thinking about that and preparing the patient for the course of therapy. So it occurred to me that microbes could have preferences. If they have preferences, then they have intelligence. And if they have intelligence, then that's completely opposite the, to the way we were thinking about microbes and cells. What was something was different and that melded together with rethinking about evolutionary biologists and became the first, uh, my first book, The Microcosm Within, in which was out in 2013, uh, which is really a uh, much more of a science text. The, the book that's come out now, which is about cellular intelligence particularly, is uh, meant for general science audience. And I think everyone who's listening could easily read this uh, and enjoy it. And I think have their minds opened to the remarkable powers of our intelligent cells. Yeah, I felt I felt like it was a very well written book. I mean, not to flatter the uh, the guest here, but uh, you know, I felt like it was a very well written book with um, you know, just some some great fundamental points. And I think we'll dive into a few more of those, you know, as we go along um, here. But before we get too far along, so I mean, in terms of you know, whenever you went to Chicago, obviously you didn't have you know, hey, I want a career change in mind. Uh, you just kind of wound up there. And I, I mean, I've walked into the Field Museum quite a few times. I remember even going there as a kid. I grew up in Northwest Indiana. So, um, you know, field trips oftentimes would be to the Field Museum, not to my more favorite, you know, science and technology museums, or even, you know, the Shedd Aquarium, where I, I definitely would enjoy things more. Instead, we would go and, you know, look at you know, all the rocks and fossils and, um, you know, other sort of things that they have at the Field Museum. But I definitely never walked in and said, this will help me clarify my career. And so, you know, it's just a, re a really interesting journey that you've taken up to this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I Let me offer to your listeners. Uh, I would say, and very few people ask me this question, which I'm really sorry about because I've thought about it an awful lot. What are those things that allowed me to go in this completely different way, taking a very large chance because I'm giving up a, a great career with great earning potential to earn basically nothing as an evolutionary biologist? Um, it was it was courageous, uh, but it was an act of passion. It was uh, a statement of self-confidence that I had something worthy to say. And but more the important than anything else were two characteristics. One I mentioned to you before was if, the concept of if. Do you want to spend the rest of your life with if? Uh, as I was mentioning to Don, a very good friend of mine who was run uh, an, uh, an executive for a, a heating and air conditioning company, a pretty large company in, in Pennsylvania, was growing dissatisfied with his job and he was thinking of starting a new company on his own. And he, he was fretting about it. He just couldn't come up with his mind. He'd, he'd anguished about it for months on end. And I said, well, I, I don't know anything about your business, but I, I do know one thing about myself. If I was in your position, I couldn't face the if of it if I didn't try. It would just crush me. If, mm. I, if I had looked 
I say, well, how will you think about this in six or seven years? And you didn't try. <laughs> and so to me, that that's a very important thing. And the second thing I said to him, because I really believe this very strongly, failure is an option. It's not that bad a thing to fail. You, no, no one wants to fail. <laughs> but what I have found out by dealing with my 50 partners in medicine is that physicians are very, very conservative and they, they are conditioned to succeed. Yeah. For them to embark in different directions where failure was possible or even probable, it, it's just they're not, they're, they, they don't have the behavior, behavioral characteristics to be willing to do it. Failure is an option. It's better, I, I believe it's better to have risked and failed than to have that if behind you. I think that's crushing. Yeah, I, I, and I would think that that, you know, probably is more central to this audience as well because of the fact that, I mean, there are a lot of people that are entrepreneurs that listen to the podcast that are in life sciences looking for the mm -hmm. next drug. Um, and I, you know, it's funny because I, I sort of am involved in this a bit of a dichotomy. So I work with both drug companies and diagnostics companies primarily. And that's just kind of the, the world that I live in. In my mind, diagnostics companies are normally, they have a lot shorter runway and that you, you normally know pretty quickly whether or not if they're gonna be successful. On the other hand, the drug company can go a number of years and, and just, you know, whoever's the leader of that company or even the, the small leadership team that they have may not know for a number of years, but it's important I think some of the things that you're saying here are really key and important to hear, which is what if you don't try? So what if you're only, if only 4% of the drug companies that are out there today that are investigating new drugs are successful? Um, you know, what if you didn't try? I mean, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what, 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 what might not come to the market, right? Well, like, this is a great um, way that you're, you're bringing this up because um There's an important message that, that is in Bioverse uh, about cellular behaviors that really pertains to exactly what you're talking about. Let me explain exactly what that is. You're a holobiont, and so am I, a fancy term. What does it mean? It means that you're an enormous assemblage of cells, your own personal cells. I've got my Bill Miller cells, and then I have trillions of microbes in me and on me. And it's together this super organism that I actually represent. That is what the environment construes as me. So I think of myself as, you know, just Bill Miller. I look in the mirror, I see myself. I say, uh, Brad Pitt, eat your heart out. And, <laughs> and I go on with my daily business, but, uh, at the same time, there are trillions of other assisting cells that I'm having a dialogue with, a constant communication with this life, not only my own personal cells, but trillions of other species. And it's together seamlessly that we're making the me that's me. So what are the dynamics underlying me as this hollow bion? How is it conceivable that these trillions and trillions of cells which in Darwinian, neo-Darwinism, the classic evolutionary narrative, they'll tell you, well, these are all highly competitive species that are all convicted, they're all competing for nutrients. And so I shouldn't exist <laughs> as the superorganism at all, which is why a new theory of evolution is necessary and, and which we talk about a little bit in the book. So what is what are the behavioral dynamics about cells? that allow them to get along together in their tens of trillions. They have consistent rules. They collaborate, they cooperate, they communicate, they're codependent and they compete and it's generally mutualizing. They all work together to protect. And this is the, the thing that cells do that humans don't because humans have egos and apparently cells don't. <laughs> they all work together and protect this generally in the greatest number, protect the self-integrity of every cell that's a constituent of the whole. 
even the so my body cells are helping my microbial cells microbial cells are helping my my body cells even my viral partners of which there are uncounted trillions are doing the same that's another topic we won't go there <laughs> and underlying it all is the specific cellular fact of intelligence that the the factor of the intelligent cell is cells have learned and don't ask me how because i don't know the exact way they do but i know that they have because that's scientifically documented you serve yourself best by serving others mm. how do you how is your business going to succeed if your chances are small of getting ahead well your best chance of succeeding is to make symbiotic relationships with other companies compete with them and try to do it in a mutualizing manner, try to get something from them and they'll give something to you. At each point in time, your sole mission is how will what I'm putting together serve others best? And if you do that, that's your best chance of serving yourself. And that's, that's the consistent and unarguable message of ourselves to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it, it is interesting, though, that there's this balance inside of all of us. And, you know, we kind of, you know, to, to where you back to where you started just a minute ago, that we think of ourselves as like just this one individual, you know, me being Don Davis and you being Bill Miller. And this is how we, you know, kind of, you know, are in the world. But the reality is we're a lot we're a lot more and a, a, a conglomeration of a lot of different a lot of different things that make up us, at least if we're going to be successful and live um, to start with. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the there's another in, very interesting principle of cellular life that I think pertains to anyone in business that actually relates to our very messy political uh, world that we live in right now. And this has to do uh, with the way information uh, is accessed um, and interpreted by cells. Every cell has to receive its information from the outside. It has to get, it gets an environmental cue. And what does it have to do? It's got to cross a cellular membrane in order for the cell to know that it's experienced anything. There's a, there's a derivative from this that is very underappreciated in biology. Every single thing that a cell knows about the outside world is self-generated. The cell has to interpret it on the inside. Hmm. It's undeniable and it's just a physical fact. What does this mean for you? Your connection, you are a collection of cells. You can't escape that. You're a cellular being, you're an assemblage, you're, a vast conglomeration of these cells all networked together so skillfully that you feel like you're just one thing. What does that mean? Your interpretation of external reality is just you. In other words, yeah. when you're dealing with competitors or colleagues, subordinates, you got to keep in mind that they can look at the world quite differently and they're not nuts. They're not stupid. They're just sensing it completely differently. That's that. This is the thing that cells get. They know that why they know it. And we don't, I guess, is human ego. And, and I think other animals uh, may also have certain senses of egos. Obviously, if you look at a lion pride, you get the idea, but cell cells have learned this art form of getting along and understanding that everyone has a self production of uh, self production of information what does what does that mean for us that's the, we're the product of that cells work together so that they can improve the quality of their information they actually know that every single one of them is going to see it in a slightly variant way mm -hmm. and far from being a problem what they're saying is great, we explore the outward environments, you know, got fancy terms like information and space time and all that good stuff that scientists <laughs> go giddy over. But it's, that's the way it, biology works. That's the way our physical system works. That's the way you work. And so it, it's healthy to keep in mind that the person that vehemently disagrees with you isn't a nutwing. 
they're just seeing it really differently and might be doing it very sincerely. They're not necessarily a bad actor. I mean, there are bad actors, but they're actually, as everyone knows who's listening to this, there, there aren't that many of them. Mostly people are trying to get along, just to get along. And it helps, I think it's really healthy to realize that it is a constituent part of our cellular life. It's the bioverse that we simply, we concoct our own view of reality. And so it helps if you're trying to get along with other people to respect the fact that their reality is valid and different. And from, I mean, from a totally scientific perspective, you know, to, to remove, you know, anything else from this, I mean, my, my sort of perspective on the, the differing perspectives that people have with different problems, you know, oftentimes from a scientific perspective or, you know, problem solving or anything else oftentimes helps, <laughs> you know, having somebody look right. at some, something from a different angle, oftentimes helps you say, well, okay, so how do I, how do I include that? I mean, one of the things that I know, you know, re recently I've been, been dealing with, with some of the organizations that I work with is change management. How do you bring in, you know, things so that, that people aren't so resistant to change? Resistance is natural, but at the same time, how do you work through that and kind of bring people along? Yeah. And, and what I'm hearing you say is, you, you know, we even have it in terms of our ourselves as well. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and want to go back to your writing just just some. So in the microcosm within, can you tell listeners just a little bit about, so what was your reason for writing that book? And then also what was the focus of the book? The reason for writing the book is to solve, uh, it's problem solving, which is what cells do. Cells communicate and they solve problems. And I'm I really believe everything I've been saying to your listeners. I think you serve yourself best by serving others. And I saw a deficiency. Uh, I felt it was a remarkable deficiency. And other colleagues of mine have had uh, had remarked on it uh, with me and in uh, our conversations together. There had really never been, there has really never been before now, a completely encompassing cellular theory of biology and evolution. This may sound crazy to your listeners. They would say, well, what else is biology about except cells? Well, it's been about genes. It's been this, most recently, it's really genes, it's, that's what's sexy. And cells have been, um, they were very big in the 19th century, but they, they kind of fell into, um, in, into the, the, the middle zone of science. Um, you have you had biomolecular pathways and you had genes but the cell as an as an organized whole as an as an entire whole was lacking also what was critically lacking and this was shocking to me is the concept of cellular intelligence was not being discussed at all and you can't actually have a biological system that doesn't begin with cellular consciousness because cellular consciousness and life are that the words we like to use are called coterminous. It just means they began at exactly the same time. Mm. So you cannot separate the two, but remarkably, there was actually nothing that had been written about that. And so I wanted a problem solve. And so I wrote, I've written, I'm kind of losing my way here. <laughs> I've, I had written um, the first book about it, and then there have been five others that, that deal with it. And now um, this uh, seventh book, um, uh, Bioverse, which is concentrates really very directly on what is the importance of the singular fact that cells are intelligent. Mm. What is our what is our actual biological narrative? So you know, in uh, Darwinism, neo Darwinism, the catchphrase "survival of the fittest" really caught on. Yeah, people sure. understand that it makes a lot of sense. People, mm. it's just very visceral. People understand exactly what it means. Well. It's not very sexy to say, well, I have a catchphrase too. It's intelligent cells measure. Um, it doesn't sound like much, but it's everything. <laughs> intelligent cells measure environmental cues and they make you. Yeah. It's, it, and the book explains all those pathways. It then goes on to something else that is going to be an eventually rare, very important to your readers. We are all lucky. You know, it's very rare for someone to get on a show and say, hey, I really got good news for you. I'll tell you, 
I've got good news for everybody. We're entering a, a new era. It's called the era of the cell. And what this means is there's going to be an explosion of science because we now, within the last decade, have finally come to understand that our cells are intelligent and that they're measuring instruments, as it were. They're not machines at all. That's another thing that's been now is being solidly put in the background. What, what does that mean for us? Well, now we're learning that they're partners of ours. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are capable of co-engineering with them. What does that mean? It means that we can use cells intelligently, deploy that intelligence, leverage that intelligence, and we can come up with vast new sets of products that will thoroughly remake our lives. And Bioverse goes in some depth into this so that you'll understand what, what this is all about. I like, I'll emphasize, this is transformative. This, this is as big a deal as anesthesia. I, I don't think uh, too many of your listeners will know the history of medicine. Why would they? But there were six revolutions uh, previously. Things like antisepsis, Robert Lister sprayed carbolic acid on, on previously deadly wounds that, and people would die of gangrene and he, he saved their lives. That was a godsend. Uh, there was vaccination with Jenner. You, you mm -hmm. can't count the, the, the hundreds of millions of people that have been saved from vaccination. Uh, antisepsis, can you imagine surgery? In Bioverse, we talk a little bit about what was, what was it like going under the knife prior to anesthetics you have no idea read the book <laughs> it's, chomped chopped down <laughs> it's gruesome I, yeah. I, I describe one operation then i describe about the miracle of anesthesia and what it meant there's germ theory there is the there are the wonder drugs penicillin and other wonder drugs each of those constituted a revolution in medicine now we've got the seventh it's a little different from the past because each of those was a specific technique like medical imaging mm -hmm. was x-ray and then ultrasound. Those are specific techniques. The revolution in the ear of the cell is a revolutionary understanding of what biology is all about. It, it is a change of frame of reference, an entire frame of reference from our romance with genes for the last 80 years to understanding that cells are organized wholes, intelligent, purposeful, problem-solving, communicative organisms that we can co-partner with and co-engineer with for our benefit. And when we, we add up all of those advances that in, in medicine, in regenerative medicine, for example, in um, biosynthetics that, that will be devised, uh, we will find ways to finally conquer or so, so significantly ameliorate all those diseases of aging that we, th we think that, you know, it's just I live long enough, I'm going to have it. I'm going to have arthritis and I'm going to have diabetes and I'm going to have hypertension. No, you, you don't have to. If we learn skillfully how to partner with our cells and our microbial cells in particular in this regard, there will be ways to well, the, I hate the word manipulate, but to lure them, to uh, partner with them, to help you uh, not have to experience these going forward. There, it definitely they, seems to me like the, I mean, epigenetics. I mean, you know, ties a lot to a lot of the things that you're saying as well. Um, you know, overall, and then it, just in terms of the. I mean, some of the new types of studies that, that you see people conducting where they use next generation sequencing and look at mm -hmm. what, you know, what specifically is happening with the cells. And you see so many, you start to see where things start to go wrong. What we don't understand yet is how do those additive, what I hear you saying too, though too is what we don't understand yet is how those additive items add up to eventually you're going to have arthritis. Eventually you're going to have cancer, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. If we could see the warning signals, maybe in advance uh, and change yeah, okay. direction, maybe we, right. maybe we don't have to go through some of yep. those difficult times. Yeah. Don, let me put it this way. Uh, right now, when we, 
uh, and I'm making broad generalizations, but uh, I think it makes the point uh, quite fairly. When we're going about trying to conquer cancer, and let's put aside the, the new types of immunotherapeutics that are starting to have a, a huge impact. Um, let's say the basic model of cancer therapy has been to pound it with a hammer. <laughs> you just, you do everything you can kill the everything. Cell cycle to kill it. Yeah. And of course you kill a lot of our important immune cells at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly one way to go about it. Well, what will the ear of the cell mean eventually in the future? When you understand that cells are partners that are co-engineering, you begin to start to rethink the way you look at cancer. What, what's different about cancer? It's a different self. It's a different entity. It's a rogue entity. And it's going to co-partner and co-engineer in a different way. What does that mean in practical terms? The better pathway will be interrupt its communications, its sensorium, the way it co-partners and co-engineers, as well as the, the area in immunology, which is immensely important, of how it's deceiving normal cells and preventing our immune cells from it, properly attacking it. So we've caught on to it with immunotherapeutics to some degree, but there's this whole new panoply of things that we can utilize to go ahead and start to work to uh, subdue cancer through the concept of cells as intelligent agents. So I don't think, uh, I have known a lot of, of cancer physicians, they're brilliant, and terribly hardworking. It's a very tough job. Um, and I don't think they spend a lot of time thinking about the personality of cancer cells. I mean, it's just kind of an odd way to put it. The ear of the cell is all about cellular behaviors. It hmm. all starts with them being highly intelligent at their scope. They're not intelligent like we are. They're, they're not going to go on Tinder and try to find a great looking date. That's not <laughs> their point. They're but they are, they are skillful problem solving agencies. Mm. So how do you go about defeating something like that? Well, you have to use um, other intelligent tool, cells. We're doing that with the immunotherapeutic, certainly. But it's, it really is all of the, high, the hidden byways of cell cell signaling that we've only very barely started to look at. Um, that's going to be the key. So the diagnostics are going to be cell cell signaling and the therapies will be beginning to be directed to understanding cell cell dynamics. The other big difference is going to be utilizing the co-partnering capabilities of our microbes, the microbiome to arrest cancers or actually create uh, a, an, an organ environment where cancers don't thrive. Let me right. give you an example. Um, and this is all very new stuff. It, it wasn't very long ago that it was absolutely certain to all people like me that our inner body, except for our gut, was sterile. So you would say to someone who's had a urinary tract infection and they had tested positive for some kind of a bug and you've treated them with an antibiotic and I come in and I'd say, well, good news, your urine is sterile. <laughs> and I thought that that was true. Of course, now we know that's completely false. The urine is different than it was. And the, the single bug that had gotten way out of whack that was causing the symptoms has been controlled. And the urine no longer reads that because we had a test that was deeply flawed that only read the highest amplitude bug that was in the mix, ignoring the thousand others that were there at very, very low amplitude. So every organ in our body has a microbiome, although it can be very tiny. Take the pancreas. It was thought that the pancreas is entirely sterile, and it turns out that it has its own constituent microbiome. Mm -hmm. Why does it matter? Well, because if that microbiome goes out of whack, and of course, we've, we biologists have a fancy term. It's called dysbiosis. I, I love fancy words. <laughs> this dysbiosis can, it was thought theoretically, set up cancer. Well, now we know it's not theoretical because recent research indicates that a fungal infection of the pancreas at a vo very low level that is not symptomatic hmm. sets up a pancreatic microbi microbial dysbiosis 
that leads to what's called in situ, the very first stages of pancreatic cancer. And of course, this has to be confirmed and confirmed and confirmed because you and all, all of us know that science is a very messy affair and it takes more than one paper to make a scientific finding. Sure. Uh, we learned that in COVID and we learned it in many other ways. Um, but that's where we're going. So what is one way to prevent pancreatic cancer? Well, at this moment, we don't have this way, but in the future, it could be where you will have a sensor that will keep track of your entire microbiome. And, and even it will even get an inkling of your pancreatic microbiome. And it might say, ah, 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 something's out of whack here and we need to adjust it. And because we have co-partnered with our intelligent cells, we'll know how to do with that. And if you think this sounds like science fiction, let me tell you, it is not. Yes, it's probably several decades out, but we are at the most, it is a great time to be alive. You wouldn't want to trade this moment for any other moment in history. You wouldn't want to be the king of France yeah. in 18, I mean, aside from getting your head chopped off, you would not want to be the king of France, Louis the 14th, who could have every pleasure imaginable. You would not trade for that guy. And that's not because you have an iPhone and he didn't. It's because <laughs> if you get appendicitis, you're going to live and that guy's going to die. Right. And so on and so on. So this is the best time to be alive. And it's going to get better because we've entered the era of the cell. And if you want to learn more about it, I know a good book for you to read. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely, you know, it, what was interesting for me about the era of the cell is that I also read Walter Isaacson's Codebreaker, right? And he, he talks about the same exact thing. In the very beginning, he talks about, you know, there was the era of the atom and the era of this and the, you know, and he, I remember, you know, that kind of coming together early in the book. And then whenever I read this, to me, it just, it, it brought back in alignment, that same level of thinking that, hey, we are in, at a, a good inflection point for science and for people in general. Absolutely. Um, we will have all sorts of complex sensors and diagnostics that will be uh, combinations of cells. Most of this will be microbial, uh, but they are going to be monitoring the environment in, in ways. They will, they will be our explorers. And of course, every, every tale of wonder has, should have its proper cautionary note. Uh, you can imagine the capacity for evil that, that could come out of this with, so uh, for example, you're leaving a trail of cells everywhere you go, your own personal cells and your microbial cells. That's why bloodhounds can track people unerringly mm. to them. It's like a highway of information about you and they can, bloodhounds are so sensitive. Their noses are so sensitive. They can track you a hundred miles and it could even be a two week old path and they can do it. <laughs> and if you think you're going to cross the river and they won't find you, you're dead wrong. They, mm. it doesn't, it doesn't matter to them. Yeah. They're it's, it's, it's the bloodhound nose is so sensitive that it's remarkable. Only more, more remarkable is a bear's, which is about 10 times more sensitive. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means that you're leaving evidence of yourself absolutely everywhere you go all the time, whether you care to or not. It is absolutely the condition of your living. So at some point, could an agency know that you had visited some place that you didn't want to? to be known to have been, you wanted privacy on this issue because you had touched a lamp or a keyboard. That, that evidence would sit there for weeks, if not months. Furthermore, if you wanted to know who's in a room at a hotel, but you don't want to enter the hotel, just scoop up the air. Um, and this is, this is not science fiction. This, is, this can be done now. It can't be done perfectly. There, there are substantial error rates yet, but give it time and it will be, it'll be perfect. I mean, and, and that ties to me more or less where, where people are trying to go with this idea of, of liquid biopsy, this idea that, Hey, look, if sure. I take, if I take a blood sample from you today, I just want to be able to detect throughout your body. Do you have cancer anywhere? And then, you know, more specifically, what type of cancer and where should we go look, you know, sure. inside of the person would, you know, absolutely, you know, be something that, that would be 
game changing for us. Like you said, it's, I mean, parts of it can be done not that accurately today, but the, I mean, there are plenty of companies that are out there. They're chasing after this, you know, sort of idea that, Hey, look, wouldn't it be nice to be able to tell people, Hey, look, that uh, you have all indications that you have potentially pancreatic cancer, you know, already underway. Um, yes. And then t- from your standpoint, I mean, if they could even get further than that, that, you know, not only could they you know, detect the cancer, but, you know, tell me how to not get cancer, because that's what we all want, I, I think, at the right. end of the day. Well, Don, let me <laughs> tell you, um, I got good news and bad news. The good news is that basically everybody's got cancer. Everybody's got that cell that ain't right. (laughs) However, here's the good news. It doesn't matter. So what have we learned about prostate cancer? It's a deadly cancer when people die of it. I have had a wonderful brother-in-law that died of it and he he was quite young. But almost every male my age has cancer cells. Sure. If you do a biopsy and you do it well enough, you, you do enough sections and you look under the microscope carefully enough, you're going to find a cancer cell or two. So what will the ear of the cell teach us? The borderlines, the cell mm-hmm. cell signaling. It, it will te- why, why did that cell start, stop being a decent co-partner that traded resources and competed, but in a generally mutualizing way with its companion normal cells? Mm-hmm. Why did it stop doing that and suddenly explodes into growth and becomes a cancer that we care about? Because we don't really care if we have cancers that we don't care about. You have infections all the time that you don't care about. You don't even know you do. Yep. You've got cook- things cooking in your sinus that if you ever looked inside your sinus, it would make you ill. But <laughs> as long as you don't have a sinus headache and your nose is not flowing, you're fine. And so what, what, is, the, what is the message of the year of the cell? What we will get from this is a much keener understanding of what needs to be treated and what doesn't need to be treated. We'll get one other thing from this, and I like to term it salutogenesis. It's another fancy biological word that I didn't make up, but I do like it. It really just means that it's the art of staying healthy in a, in a really personalized way. It's personalized medicine to the point where it really matters. So for example, if I go to the doctor and let's say I have high blood pressure, sure, he's going to start to give me a round of medications that has generally worked for most people that, that she or he is treated. And of course, that's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I'm Bill Miller. So knowing Bill Miller luck, the first three ones are going to make me feel really sick. And then I'll get to the fifth and sixth and those will be terrific and I'll be, I'll be happy. In the ear of the cell, eventually, you won't go through that. There will be a a set of sensors and detectors that will either, first of all, you may never have gotten hypertension like you would have anyway, so you might be genetically prone to it. Sure. But that genetically prone is because you tend to have a specific microbiome. That's what your genetic profile is leading you to have is a specific gut microbiome that's leading you to have an abnormal production of a specific set of metabolites that interacts with the, um, the, the renal receptors that lead to elevated angiotensin that leads to hypertension. And I'm not, that, that's not even theoretical. That's, that's a pathway that is known. So that pathway may be interdicted through cell, understanding cell cell signaling or you will get, your cells will be pre-tested to see how they're going to react to the medications before you have to take them. You'll, a whole, that battery will be done for you. And you'll take one that is very likely to help you right from the get-go and spare you a, a possible couple of weeks of feeling lousy or an actual, you know, really serious reaction. So uh, these are not theoretical things in the future. These will happen. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. So and- this is great news. And we're starting to see some of that, you know, even like you said, I mean, in terms of some of the personalized medicines for cancers um, and, you know, and other things. But, you know, again, there's there's so much that can be done in this area. And I definitely look forward to the the overall f- future. I want to bring us kind of you know near the end here. So um, so with regards to the Bioverse, when does the book mm-hmm. come out? The book comes out uh, October 15th. And it is already available for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, 
and on the website of my publisher, uh, Roman Littlefield. Perfect. And then I also read that there's that somebody's working on a, a docu series as well. Yeah, I've been. Um, this really, this all got started. I, I was really very fortunate. I was working with a specific uh, biotech company as a writer, a science writer, uh, which I was very privileged to be asked to do. And uh, it's run by two brilliant principals. And um, one of the first assignments that they gave me was uh, they asked me, could I write up a docu-series? So before the book actually came the, the concept of a docu-series. And the docu-series would concentrate on the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And as I wrote it up, I, I wanted to, to enlarge it because there's no sense to talk about the microbiome until you talk about intelligent cells. If you talk about intelligent cells, you might as, might as well talk about all cells. So uh, the docu series uh, I wrote up became a, a ten-part docu series, uh, which they uh, purchased, and um, it's still in it is in the works. It's in development, and I'm hopeful still that it's in the it's being planned. Um, there's a script writer and that Great. I will eventually work with. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you for asking. Yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds extremely exciting. And um, I mean, I definitely, I've enjoyed, you know, all sorts of methods of trying to learn, you know, more about both vaccines as well as the microbiome. And so, you know, I definitely, you know, will, will be somebody that would enjoy, enjoy this as well. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? What inspires me is, uh, I, I sound like a broken record, you serve yourself best by serving others. I really believe that understanding that has calmed me down. It's the, it, it, it inspires me to be a, an apostle of cellular intelligence, to, to be a, uh, to agitate for our recognition about how we can partner with our critical microbiomes and make our lives better. And I think that, that we have at this point an educated public that's interested in, in learning about it. So I'm, I'm inspired by this mission of trying to, to get these ideas out and about and, and let people know that there's good news in front of them. Thank you for that. And what concerns you? What concerns me is it's it's very slow in science certain theories in science take a very very long time to to fade away for example um, there was a theory that things burned because there was an intrinsic aspect of the thing that burned wood burned because there was a thing in wood that burned had nothing to do with oxygen. Lavoisier, um, the French scientist, hundreds of years ago found out that it, oxygen was necessary for wood to burn. You would think that the phlogiston theory was called phlogiston, this internal thing that, that, that things burn because they had excesses of phlogiston and the phlogiston itself was burning and didn't need anything else to burn. Mm. You'd think that that would have died away fast, instantly. It carried on for a very long time. In our era, we have a strong sensibility that vaccination is problematic. That is not new. That has been since uh, even before vaccination, there was a technique called variolation, and it was employed by the Chinese and then uh, the, the the Muslims, uh, the Turks, in particular, to prevent smallpox back in the 17 and 1800s. Um, eventually, Jenner came up with actual vaccination. It took forever for vaccination to become accepted. And the, and the reason that we have a strong anti-vaccination movement right now is collective amnesia. People mm -hmm. have forgotten exactly what life was like before. I am not saying that vaccines cannot have problems. I don't want anyone misinterpreting me. Absolutely, those are risks that have to be thought about, and the, the work has to be done carefully. But the concept of vaccination 
is one of the great miracles of American, uh, of, uh, of not American, of human history. And so I'm concerned that the good things of the ear of the cell will take much longer to reach fruition because of generalized resistance of one kind or another that can't even be predicted until you get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing to me how, um, even even with a lot of scientific evidence, how difficult it can become just to have a conversation about vaccination in general. And so, you know, yeah, I definitely agree. It's, it's the same thing for, I, I know we don't have real time here, but it's the same thing for evolution. I, I, I am uh, the originator of an entirely new uh, narrative of evolution called cognition-based evolution. It starts the, the narrative of evolution right where it belongs with intelligent cells. Uh, we don't have time to go through that. I guarantee you, decades from now, neo-Darwinism and survival of the fittest, will, which it's, which talks about competition instead of collaboration, will still be at the forefront, and I'll still be battling. I mean, I hope to be around a while. I'll be I'll be battling the good fight on that one. Yeah, and then last question for you is: What excites you? What excites me is my chance to get in front of audiences just like this and teach you about the, the wonderful things that are going to happen in science. We're at the beginning of an enormous explosion of scientific knowledge and it will make all the difference in your lives. It will make your life better and very particularly the life of your children and grandchildren much better than it has ever been before. It's a great time to be alive. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, uh, it, I, I just absolutely, I, I'm so excited by where we're at from a scientific standpoint. I'm so excited, you know, just seeing some of the things that are happening for people, you know, in uh, life sciences, especially, and, and just, you know, kind of the future that, you know, could happen. Um, just the potential of, of what could happen is, is encouraging. So, um, where can people find out more about you and where do they find, uh, you know, more ab out about your books and the things that you're working on? You can go to my website, ourbioverse.com. I couldn't get bioverse itself. Someone else had it. So it's ourbioverse.com. And I have a science feed. It's purely science. No, no other opinions of any kind, uh, at Bill Miller, MD, Twitter at Bill Miller, MD. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for spending time with me today and being on the Life Science Success Podcast. I greatly appreciate you being here. Thank you, Don. It was a privilege. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.